This is a very brief introduction to electronics. It has nothing directly to do with free energy, but as circuits are frequently part of free energy devices, it's very helpful if you can understand the basics of circuit diagrams. It's not difficult. This presentation pretends that current flows from plus to minus, which is the conventional method. Most circuits have a line at the top and a line at the bottom, like these ones shown here. Those lines represent a continuous electrical connection, which might be metal bars, copper strips on a printed circuit board, or perhaps wires. There is presumed to be no voltage drop along the length of those conductors. Those conductors are sometimes called rails. The symbol on the left here represents a battery made up of more than one cell. The diagram shown above is not considered to be a circuit because there's no path for current flow from the plus of the battery to the minus of the battery. Uh, it becomes a circuit when there is a possible current flow path. This diagram here shows the, a flow path. The current can go from the plus of the battery along the conductor down through these two things which are resistors and back to the minus of the battery which is marked as zero volts. These zigzag shapes are marked 100 and 800 and they represent resistors which alternatively can be represented just by a rectangle. Resistors allow current flow through them, but they restrict the amount of current which can flow through them. Key to understanding circuits is voltage, as voltage controls how every circuit works. A new battery has a voltage between its terminals. This voltage is said to cause a current to flow through any complete electrical circuit placed across it. The current flowing through the circuit can cause various things to happen, such as creating light, creating sound, creating heat, creating magnetism, creating movement, creating sparks, and so on. By using the current caused by a voltage, a device called a voltmeter can indicate how big the voltage is. The bigger the voltage, the bigger the current, and the bigger the display on the voltmeter. The voltmeter can have a numerical display, where you read the voltage directly from the display, or it can be an analog voltmeter, where the voltage is shown by the position of a needle on a scale. The size of the voltage is stated in volts, which is a unit of measurement named after the man Volta introduced voltage to the world. Voltage was always there, we just didn't know about it. Voltages add up, and if they're connected the same way around, the plus terminals all facing the same way, it increases like this. A single battery of a, an ordinary dry cell will read as 1.5 volts on a voltmeter. If you put two of them connected in a row, which is called in series, the two 1.5 volts add up and you get a 3 volt reading on the voltmeter. The physical size of the battery usually determines the length of time that that battery can supply any given current. The bigger the battery, the longer it can provide any given current. A battery is constructed from a number of cells. The number of cells in the battery controls the voltage of the battery. For example, an AA size battery, what used to be called a pen light battery, has a single cell and so produces 1.5 volts when new. A very much larger and heavier D size battery also just has one cell and so it also produces 1.5 volts when new. The difference, apart from the higher cost and higher size and weight of the D cell, is that the larger cell can provide a much higher current if both batteries are discharged over the same period of time. 
There are several types of battery construction. A rechargeable nickel cadmium battery has a single cell, but its construction method means that it produces about 1.35 volts when fully charged, although it only claims to be a 1.2 volt battery. In passing, nickel cadmium batteries have a memory characteristic, which means that if they're recharged before they're fully discharged, then the next time they're discharged they run out of power at the voltage level it had when the last charging was started. Consequently, it's a good idea to fully discharge a nickel cadmium battery before charging it again. That type of battery has been replaced nowadays with nickel manganese batteries, as they don't have a memory. Car and motorcycle batteries are described as lead acid batteries. This type of construction is not very convenient as it's large, heavy, and potentially corrosive. The big advantage though are the ability to produce very high currents and it gives 2 volts per cell. These batteries are normally produced to 6 volt or 12 volt units. The amp hours for a lead acid car battery is usually quoted for a 20 hour discharge period. So a fully charged new 20 amp hour battery can provide one amp for 20 hours of continuous use. If that battery is loaded to give 5 amps, it will not provide that current for 4 hours. It might only last 2 hours, or perhaps a little better. The manufacturer's literature should give an indication of the performance, but it's important to run your own test to see how your particular battery actually works in practice. Mains units are known in the electronics world as power supply units, or PSUs for short. These convert the mains voltage, which is 220 volts in Europe, 110 volts in America, to some convenient low voltage, be it 12 volts, 9 volts, 6 volts, or whatever is needed. Some mains units can provide several different voltages simultaneously. Here are three common types of battery. This is an ordinary dry cell disposable battery and it produces 1.5 volts. This is a very common disposable battery, uh, though it is available as a rechargeable version sometimes. It has 9 volts and the 9 volts are made up from a whole row of uh, very small cells packed together inside the battery. This last one here is a lead acid battery. It's very much heavier but it has a much higher performance and it normally produces a nominal 12 volts which in practice is typically 12.8 volts or more. Circuit diagrams can look very complicated and very difficult but they're generally made up of just a few components so you really don't have to learn very much to understand them. The main components are resistors capacitors, transistors, diodes, coils, and integrated circuits. It's not difficult to understand how they work and how to use them, so let's start with resistors. The symbols used can be a zigzag like this, or just an ordinary rectangle. If a resistor is connected across a battery, a circuit is formed, and a current flows around the circuit. The current cannot be seen, but that doesn't mean that it's not there. The current is measured in amps, and the instrument to use to display the current flow is an ammeter. If we place an ammeter in the circuit, it will show the current flowing around the circuit. Also shown in the circuit is a bulb. If the current flowing around the circuit is sufficiently high, and the bulb chosen co is being chosen correctly, then the bulb will light up, showing the current is flowing, while the ammeter will indicate exactly how much current is flowing. Now on the right here is the way that the circuit would be shown by an electronics expert. The resistor, ammeter and lamp labels would almost certainly not be shown. The physical arrangement though is like this. 
There are various different styles of drawing circuit diagrams, but they're the same in the basic essentials. One important common feature is that unless there is some very unusual and powerful reason not to do so, every standard style circuit diagram will have the positive voltage line horizontally at the top of the diagram and the negative voltage line as a horizontal line at the bottom. These are often referred to as the positive and negative rails. Where possible, the circuit is drawn so that the operation takes place from left to right. That is, the first action taken by the circuit is on the left and the last action is placed on the right. Resistors are manufactured in several sizes and varieties. They come in fixed and variable versions. The most commonly used are the fixed carbon E12 range. This is a range of values which has 12 resistor values which repeat. So you have values which are 10 ohms, 12 ohms, 15 ohms, 18, 22, 27, 33, 39, 47, 56, 68 and 82. Then it moves up and you get 100 ohms, 120 ohms, 150 ohms and so on along the range up to 820 ohms. Then it moves up to 1000 ohms, 1200 ohms, 1500 ohms and so on on up to 8200 ohms. Nowadays circuits often carry very little power so the resistors can and are made in very small physical sizes. The higher the resistance value of a resistor the less current will flow through it when a voltage is placed across it. As it can be difficult to see printing on small resistors clustered together on a circuit board and surrounded by other larger components, the resistor values are not written on the resistors. Instead, the resistors are color-coded. The unit of measurement for resistors is the ohm, which is a very small size. Most resistors which you encounter will be in the range of 100 ohms to a million ohms. The color code used on resistors is black is 0, brown is 1, red is 2, orange is 3, yellow is 4, green is 5, blue is 6, purple is 7. If your eyesight is very good in color, that would be violet. 8 is gray and 9 is white. Each resistor has typically got three color bands to indicate its value. The first two bands are the numbers of the resistor and the third band is the number of zeros following. So in this resistor here which has got green, blue, red, the green is 5, the blue is 6 and the red represents two zeros. So the value is 5600 ohms or sometimes written 5.6k, where k stands for a thousand. Or if there are spaces restricted, it uses the k to represent the decimal point, and is written 5k6. On this resistor, the colors are yellow, purple, green. The yellow is 4, the purple is 7, and the green represents five zeros. So the value is four seven followed by five zeros ohms which is 4.7 million ohms or 4m7 if space is restricted. Color bands are le read from left to right. And the first band is close to one end of the body of the resistor. There's often a fourth band which indicates the manufacturing tolerance you can ignore that band. Some examples of this would be red, red, red. That's two, two and two zeros, or 2.2k. Another could be yellow, purple, orange, which is four, seven and three zeros, or 47k. Another could be brown, black, brown, which is one, zero and one zero. So that's 100 ohms, or 100 R. Another could be orange, 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 which is 3, 
3 and 3 zeros, which is 33k. Another could be brown, green, red, which is 1, 5, and 2 zeros, or 1.5k, or 1k5. Another could be brown, green, black, which is 1 for the brown, 5 for the green, and black is 0, so there are no noughts or zeros after it. So that's a total of 15 ohms, which is a low value resistor. You could have blue, grey, orange, which is 6, 8 and 3 zeros, or 68k. Another would be brown, green, green, which is 1, 5 and 5 zeros, which is 1,500 ohms, or 1.5m, or 1m5 if space is restricted. Now you could have yellow, purple, brown which is 470 ohms, or 470 ohms. There are only 12 standard resistors in each decade, so there are only 12 sets of the first two colours. So 10 is brown-black, 12 is brown-red, 15 is brown-green, 18 is brown-grey, 22 is red-red, 27 is red-purple, 3-3 three three is orange-orange, 3-9 three is orange-white, 4-7 is yellow-purple, 5-6 is green-blue, 6-8 is blue-grey, and 8-2 is grey-red. And the resistors, when they're done up and shown in colour, look like this. 10 ohms is brown, black, black. Um, 100 ohms is brown, black, brown. 1000 ohms is brown, black, uh, red. So you will see the repetition of the multiplier as you go along. So you've got black for no zeros, brown for one zero, and red for two zeros. The sequence continues on up with there being three zeros for the orange, four zeros for the yellow, and five zeros for the green. And that takes you all the way up to 8.2 uh, meg ohms, 8.2 million ohms. So that is all the basic information on resistor color codes. And you should be able to read any color code on any resistor. Now, leaving the details of identifying individual resistors, we now come to the interesting part of what happens when there are several resistors in a circuit. The important thing is to keep track of the voltages generated within the circuit. These define the currents flowing, the power used, and the way in which the circuit will respond to external events. Take this circuit here. You've got a 9 volt battery powering the circuit, You've got two resistors, R1 and R2, and a voltmeter measuring the voltage at point A. So the big question is, what's the voltage at point A? If you feel like saying, who cares? Then the answer is you, if you want to understand how circuits work, because the voltage at point A is vital. If R1 has the same resistance as R2, then the voltage at A will be half of the battery voltage, that is 4.5 volts, because half the voltage is dropped across R1 and half the voltage is dropped across R2. It doesn't matter what the actual resistance of R1 and R2 are, as long as they have exactly the same resistance. The higher the resistance, the less current flows, the longer the battery lasts, and the more difficult it is to measure the voltage accurately. There is no need to do any calculations to determine the voltage at point A, as the ratio of the resistor values is what determines the voltage. If you really want to, you can calculate the voltage, though it's not necessary. The method for doing this will be shown to you shortly. Here are some examples with different resistors. The battery is 12 volts. Positive rail runs all the way along at 12 plus 12 volts. 
the negative rail runs all the way along at zero volts. Here are two resistors, 100 and 300 ohms. And the question is, what's the voltage where they join? And the answer is 9 volts, because there are 400 units, or 4 units if you prefer to work in 100 ohm chunks. So a quarter of 12 volts is 3 volts, so it'll be 3 volts across the 100, and 3 threes are 9 volts across the 300, which means that the voltage will be 9 volts above the 0 volt rail, or if you prefer, it'll be 3 volts down from the 12 volt rail. In this case, we have 200 and 200. The two resistors are the same, so the voltage drop across them will be the same, because the same current flows through them. So there'll be a 6 volt drop on both of the resistors, so the voltage where they join will be 6 volts. If you take these two resistors, there's a 100 and a 500. So a 60 or 12 volts will be dropped across the 100, which is 2 volts, and 5 6, or 5 times 2, or 10 volts, will be dropped across the 500 ohm resistor, which means the voltage where they join will be plus 10 volts. Now the same division of supply voltage can be produced by positioning the slider of a variable resi resistor at different points by rotating the shaft of the device. If you put it up at the top, then there is no resistance between the top of the variable resistor and the positive 12 volt rail. So there will be 12 volts on the slider. If you s move the slider down to the bottom of the resistor, you have a direct short circuit to the zero volt rail and the voltage on the slider will be zero volts. Now this means that depending on where you put the shaft of your variable resistor, it controls the voltage between the positive rail and the negative rail to whatever you choose to set it at. If you put it a third of the way down, you'll have four volts dropped across this part, eight volts dropped across that part, and the voltage on it will be plus eight. If you put it a third of the way from the bottom, then it'll be 4 volts across the bottom part, 8 volts across the upper part, and the voltage on the slider will be plus 4 volts. The determination of voltage levels in a circuit is the key factor to understanding electronic circuitry. The voltage levels control what currents flow and how every circuit will perform. So it's essential to understand what's happening. Please understand that a good battery is an unlimited source of voltage, and the voltage does not get used up when a resistor or whatever is connected across it. Let's look at it again very carefully. There is no voltage drop along the positive rail. It's a, a conductor which has very low resistance. There is a voltage drop where you've got two resistors connected across the battery itself. The voltage drop is at the isolated point in the middle. There can be some difficulty in understanding the zero volt connection in a circuit. All this means is that it's the return line for current flowing from the battery get back to the battery. Most conventional circuits are connected to both sides of the battery and that allows the current to flow round a closed circuit from one terminal of the battery to the other terminal of the battery. It's normal practice to draw a circuit diagram so that the plus terminal of the battery is at the top and the minus terminal is at the bottom. Many circuit diagrams show the negative line at the bottom connected to the ground or an earth connection, which is literally a metal rod driven into the ground to make a good electrical connection to the ground. This is done because the earth is literally a vast reservoir of electricity. However, in reality, most circuits are not connected directly to earth in any way. The standard circuit diagram can be visualized 
like a graph of voltage. The higher up the diagram, the higher the voltage. Anyway, when there's a circuit connected across the battery, the negative or zero volt line just indicates the return battery to the return current flow path of the battery for the current to circulate through the circuit. The principle applies immediately to the following circuit. We've got two components here which you may not be familiar with. The first is a variable resistor which we've been discussing briefly and the second is a transistor. The circuit shows the transistor uh, being fed current from the slider of the variable resistor. Now this circuit is dangerous. There should be a resistor between the base and the slider so that if you are stupid enough to move the um, slider up to the very top line uh, you don't actually burn out the base to emitter junction in your transistor which could well happen if you push too much current through it. Anyway, um, the arrangement is very straightforward. If you put the slider of the variable resistor down low, there's not enough voltage between the base and the emitter of the transistor to drive any current through it. That means the transistor is solidly switched off. And what that means is there is a very high resistance to current flow between the emitter and collector. That resistance is generally very much higher than whatever value is chosen for resistor R2. That means that when the transistor is off, there's a very high voltage across the transistor and a very low voltage across R2. And you can see that on a voltmeter if you connect it. If you turn the uh, variable resistor up so that it becomes higher and higher, it starts to feed current between the base and emitter of the transistor itself. Now, that will persuade the transistor to switch on. It normally takes 0.7 volts or so for most transistors to start conducting current between the base and emitter. But when a current does flow, the transistor switches on, which means it has a very low resistance value between the collector and the emitter. And as that's in series with resistor R2, it has a, a very much lower resistance than R2, so there is an extremely low voltage, typically 0.1 volts or less, across the transistor and pretty much all the battery voltage across resistor R2. If you choose the right bulb and put a bulb in instead then you can see when the transistor switches on and you can see when the transistor switches off as you move the slider on the variable resistor. You could if you wish put in a thing called a relay. A relay is an electronic switch which closes two or more contacts when the relay is powered. If you put a buzzer in instead of R2, then you'll be able to hear when the transistor switches on. And if, for instance, you were to put a resistor and a light-dependent resistor instead of the variable resistor here, then uh, the circuit can be made to switch on and off itself when light level increases or decreases, which is the way that street lights tend to work. So, let's look at resistors in slightly more detail now. If you put a 9 volt battery across a resistor, a current will flow. And we'd like to know how big the current is, even before we connect the resistor. So there is a calculation which is called Ohm's Law. Ohm's Law only applies to circuits with resistance. It doesn't apply to other circuits with different components like coils in them or motors. But Ohm's Law says 
ohms is equal to volts divided by amps. And that shows the units of measurement used. So if you have one vo ohm and one volt, then the current flowing will be one amp. Now in the circuit here, the voltage is 9 volts. And if the resistor is 100 ohms, then using Ohm's law we can calculate the current flowing around the circuit because 100 ohms is equal to 9 volts divided by the amps. Or if you turn it around a bit, the amps is equal to 9 divided by 100, which is 0 0.09 amps. To avoid decimal places, the unit of 1 milliamp is used. There are 1000 milliamps in 1 amp, and the current just calculated there would commonly be expressed as 90 milliamps, which is written as 90 MA, that's little m, capital A. In the circuit above, if the 9 volts, if the voltage is still 9 volts and the resistor is 330 ohms, then using Ohm's law, we can calculate the current flowing around the circuit as 330 equaling 9 divided by the amps, which is another way of saying that amps is equal to 9 volts divided by 330 ohms, which works out as 0.027 amps, which you would normally write down as 27 milliamps. Using Ohm's law, we can calculate what resistor to use to give any required current flow. For example, if the voltage is 12 volts and you want 250 milliamps to flow, then Ohm's equals volts over amps, the resistor given by ohms equals 12 over 0.25 amps, which is 48 ohms. The closest standard resistor is 47 ohms, which is color bands yellow, purple, black. The final thing to do is to check that the wattage of the resistor is OK. You don't want the resistor to burn out when it's connected into the proposed circuit. The power calculation is always given by watts is equal to volts times amps. In the last example, this gives watts is equal to 12 times 0 0.25, which is 3 watts. This is much larger than most resistors used in circuitry nowadays. Taking the earlier example, watts equals volts times amps, so watts equals 9 times 0 0.025, which gives 0 0.334 watts. Again, to avoid decimals, a unit of 1 milliwatt is used, where 1000 milliwatts equals 1 watt. So instead of writing 0 0.234 watts, it's common to write it as 234 milliwatts. This method of working out voltages, resistances and wattages applies to any circuit, no matter how awkward the circuit may look. Just before we leave the subject of resistors and move on, we come across the term potentiometer. This term is often shortened to POT, and many people use it to describe a, vari a variable resistor. I only mention this so that you can understand what they're talking about. A variable resistor is not a potentiometer, and really should not be called one. A fancy name for voltage is potential, so a circuit powered by a 12-volt battery can be described as having a potential of 0 volts at the negative side of the battery and a potential of plus 12 volts at the positive side of the battery. Ordinary folks like me would just say voltage instead of potential. When a voltmeter is used to measure the voltage at any point in a circuit, it alters the circuit by drawing a small amount of current from the circuit. The voltmeter usually has a high internal resistance and so the current drawn from the circuit is very small. But even though it is a small current, it does alter the circuit. Consequently, the measure made is not quite correct. Scientists in years gone by overcame the problem with a very neat solution. They measured the voltage without taking any current from the circuit, which is pretty neat. They also did it with a very simple arrangement, which is shown here. They used a sensitive meter to measure the current. This meter is built so that the meter in a central is in a central position if no current is flowing. They used to call it a galvanometer. 
With the positive current flowing, the needle deflects to the right. With the negative current flowing, the needle deflects to the left. They then connected a variable resistor right across the same battery which was powering the circuit. The top end of the variable resistor, VR1, is at plus 12 volts, and they call that a potential of plus 12 volts, and the bottom end of VR1 is at 0 volts, or a potential of 0 volts. By moving the slider of VR1, any voltage can between 0 and plus 12 volts can be selected. And what they would do is they would move the slider on the variable resistor until the meter registered absolute zero current flowing through it. Since the meter reading is zero, the current flowing through it is also zero, and the current taken from the circuit is zero. As no current has been taken from the circuit, the measurement is not affecting the circuit in any way, which is very clever. The voltage on the slider of VR1 exactly matches the voltage at point A. So with the calibrated scale on the variable resistor, the voltage can be read off. The slick piece of equipment made from the battery, the variable resistor and the meter was used to measure the potential or voltage at any point, and so it was called a potentiometer. So please humor me by calling a variable resistor a variable resistor and not a potentiometer. As I said before, this is not at all important, and if you want to, you can call a variable resistor a heffalump, as long as you understand how it works. Now let's see if we can understand what circuit diagrams mean. Many people look at a circuit diagram and have no idea what it means, so let's if see if we can make the mystery go away. Take this circuit, for example, here. It's got three components plus some wire. The symbol B represents a battery, or more strictly speaking, a battery made up of a number of cells. The symbol R represents a resistor, as described before, and the LED is a light-emitting diode, which probably looks like this. Um, with this LED, the longer connecting lead is the plus. Many LEDs need more than 1.5 volts to light up, and while it's very easy to think of a single AA-sized battery as being 1.5 volts, the very common AA-sized nickel-manganese batteries are only 1.2 volts. So let's set up the circuit using a 9-volt battery and a 330-ohm resistor, which would have colour bands orange, orange, brown. And that's there to limit the current flowing through the LED. The circuit starts off by connecting the battery through a wire to the resistor. And this indicates the plus of the battery gets connected to the resistor. You can do that using some wire, or the resistor could be connected directly to the battery. So there's your 330 ohm resistor, orange, orange, brown, connected to the plus terminal of a 9 volt battery. Then the LED gets connected to the other end of the resistor. So you have your battery and resistor as before, and the positive line of the LED is then connected to the other side of the resistor. Finally, the other side of the LED is connected to the minus of the battery. And you just connect that with a piece of wire or something similar to the negative connection on the battery and that will cause the LED to light up. If you connect the LED the wrong way around it will not damage anything but it won't light up. Poor quality connections can be made by twisting wires together. Better quality connections can be made by using screw connectors. Screw connectors are available in the local hardware shop or um, they're very easy to find and buy and they're very cheap. They come in several sizes depending on how much current they can carry. Generally speaking, in electronic circuits, we use the smallest size available. Uh, if the spacing is a problem and pins won't match it, it's sometimes necessary to cut off 
one of the connectors and use them as separate connectors. Another way to deal with making up di um, circuit diagrams uh, is using a plug-in board. And that used to be very good, but nowadays it's not that great because along came our integrated circuits with our very small pin spacings. The pin spacings used to be an eighth of an inch and the connections were quite straightforward. Nowadays the pin spacings are only a tenth of an inch and while that doesn't sound like much of a difference it really is a very big difference. And the holes in current plug-in boards are now so small that you can't plug in quite ordinary components such as the fast-acting ultra-fast 5408 diode because the diode wire is just too big to plug into the hole. The most effective method of connection is to solder the com components together. And that's not partic it's not particularly difficult to do that. Vero board or strip board is convenient and there are several other board styles which can be used. When I was very young and almost no components were available, I used drawing pins and soldered components to them, killing the excess of heat using a wet cloth, which is a very effective way of dropping temperature very rapidly. However, no matter what method of connection is used, you just follow along the connecting lines in any diagram to see what components are connected together. Now we come to capacitors. Capacitors come in many sizes, types and makes. Their size is stated in farads, but as the farad is a very large unit, you're likely to use capacitors rated in microfarads, as a microfarad is a millionth of one farad. The symbol for a microfarad is mu f, where mu is the letter of the Greek alphabet. This is a pain for normal text production as Greek letters do not occur in your average font. Some circuit diagrams give up on mu and just write it as uf, which looks like mu f slightly misprinted, where the descender of the mu has not got printed. Anyway, the very large capacitors which you may encounter range from 5,000 microfarads to maybe as much as 20,000 microfarads. Large capacitors range from 10 microfarads to 5,000 microfarads. Medium-sized capacitors run from 0.1 microfarads to about 5 microfarads. And small capacitors are those below 0.1 microfarad. There are 1,000 nanofarads, NF, in 1 microfarad. And there are 1,000 picofarads, PF, in 1 nanofarad. So, 0.01 microfarads can be written as 10 nf, 0.1 microfarads can be written as 100 nf, and 0.1 nf can be written as 100 pf. Capacitors larger than 1 microfarad tend to be polarized. In other words, the capacitor has a plus connector and a minus connector. It does not matter which way around you connect it, the larger capacitors have a voltage rating and this must not be exceeded as the capacitor can be damaged and possibly even totally destroyed. Capacitors can be added together but surprisingly they add up in the reverse way to resistors. In example 1 here you can see you've got two 116 volt uh, electrolytic capacitors and they're connected together in series. That gives you, surprisingly, a capacitor which is only 50 microfarads in capacity but has a 32 volt rating. So you get twice the voltage and half the capacitance. If you connect three of them together, each at 16 volts, you get a third of your 300, uh, a third of your 100 microfarads, which is 33 microfarads and you get the three 16 volts to give you 48 volts. If you connect them in parallel rather than in series like we've been talking about, they add up normally. 
and you get the same 16 volts as before and a total of 3 times 100 microfarads. So the com composite capacitor is 300 microfarads at 16 volts. There's no need for the capacitors to have similar values. These are merely shown that way in the examples to make the arithmetic easier and not distract you from the ways in which the capacitors interact together. Occasionally a circuit needs a large capacitor which is not polarized. This can be provided by placing two polarized capacitors back to back like this with the pluses connected together. Again, the overall capacitance is halved as before. The overall voltage rating is doubled as before and that is the way that you can get a non-polarized large capacitor if you need one. Generally you don't need one. The American style of circuit diagram um, markings are slightly different. They tend to show the positive line, the positive side of a capacitor as a straight line and the uh, negative side as being a curved line. In Europe the positive side tends to be a block and the negative side tends to be the straight line. When the capacitors are connected the way it doesn't matter which end of the pair are connected together because it's a non-polarized capacitor. Large capacitors usually have their, capaci their capacitance and voltage printed on the outside of the capacitor. But small capacitors are usually far too tiny for that to be possible. So a code very much like used with resistors is used for small capacitors. The code is a two-digit code for capacitors up to 100 picofarads and for the high valu higher values is a three-digit code where the first two digits are the numerical value of the capacitor in picofarads and the third digit is the number of zeros following the two digits. 1000 picofarads is one nanofarad 1000 nanofarads is one microfarad. Here are some common values. A 10 PF would be a code 10. 22 PF would be 22. And so on up to 470 PF is 471. 1 nanofarad is 102. 2.2 nanofarads is 222. 4.7 nanofarads is 472. 10 nanofarads is 103. And this is the typical set of values used with tiny capacitors. But we need to be serious about capacitors here. High voltages are very, very dangerous. Do not become so familiar with them that you treat them casually. High voltages can kill you. Capacitors are capable of building up high voltages and some good makes can hold that high voltage charge for several days after being disconnected. In particular, do not try to make adjustments to or take parts from the insides of a TV set. A black and white TV set uses 18,000 volts on the magnetic coils used to create the moving picture if the TV set has a tube. A capacitor inside the set may well have that voltage on it three days after the set was last used. Don't fool around inside a TV set. It could kill you. Or if you're really unlucky, it could injure you for life. A colour TV set uses 27,000 volts to operate the coils inside it. And that will fry you very rapidly if you touch it. Now that's for non-flat screen TVs, the type that have tubes inside them. And please don't think that you're safe if you don't quite touch it. 27,000 volts can jump across a gap to your hand. If you try to discharge a TV capacitor using a metal screwdriver with a wooden handle, please ensure that your medical insurance is up to date before you do it. You can receive a hefty shock through the screwdriver handle. Voltages up to 24 volts should be quite safe. However, 
Some circuits will generate very high voltages, even though the battery driving the circuit is low voltage. A standard off-the-shelf inverter circuit produces 240 volts AC from a 12 volt battery. Just because the battery is only 12 volts does not mean that the circuit is not dangerous. Circuits which have coils in them can produce high voltages, especially if they contain large capacitors. The voltage which produces the spark in your car engine is very high and that voltage comes from the 12 volt car battery. You know enough about this now, so pay attention. Alright, so let's take a look at an integrated circuit. The most popular and most produced integrated circuit is the 555 timer chip. It's an exceptionally useful chip and it can be used in oscillator and timer circuits. Its use is so widespread that the chip price is very low for its capability. It can operate with voltages from 5 volts to 18 volts and its output can handle 200 milliamps. It takes 1 milliamp when its output is low and 10 milliamps when its output is high. It comes in an 8 pin dual inline package and the pin connections are as shown here. It the device can operate as a monostable or nastable multivibrator, a Schmidt trigger or an inverting buffer, which is low current input and high current output. Here it is wired as a Schmidt trigger. Now the advantage of a Schmidt trigger is you have a, a slowly rising voltage on the input and the output stays low until it reaches a certain threshold and then the output suddenly switches high until such time as the voltage drops down again. That's what a Smith trigger does. This is a monostable um, version. In this particular one it uses a press button switch to short circuit pin 2 to the ground or not volt of the power supply. The situation is that in a lot of these circuits, instead of having a press button switch, the voltage on pin 2 is pushed down by a capacitor connected to a rapidly falling voltage further up the circuit. Anyway, what happens is it causes the 555 to change state. The output goes high, but the output doesn't stay high for very long because current flows through the 10K resistor through into the 10 microfarad capacitor which ja gradually charges up and that then causes the 555 circuit to flop back again into its original state. Uh, the Americans call that a flip-flop. Um, then we move to as tables which are very popular oscillators. This one has a fixed or equal mark space ratio. That means it's high for exactly the same length of time as it's low on each of the pulses. The other one is quite commonly used. It's got two resistors and a capacitor and it has an unevenly spaced mark space ratio. The frequencies that are produced by say a 10k resistor and a 1 microfarad capacitor is 72 hertz or 72 cycles per second. For instance if you have 100k and 100 new then the cycle time of the circuit will be 14 seconds. So you can go from a high rate of oscillation 72,000 a second down to quite long time delays this one here is 600 seconds, which is commonly called 10 minutes. So this table shows you the way that the um, thing goes. So Supposing you want uh, a circuit that gives you a brief output once every 10 minutes. <coughs> Stage 1 is to produce the 10 minute timing. And you can use a 555 timer chip as that's the most convenient way of doing it. However, 
The problem with simple circuits with a long cycle time is that the time interval is determined by the length of time it takes for a capacitor to charge up. That needs a large capacitor and a very small charging current. But large capacitors leak the charge away, unless they're very high quality capacitors. The highest quality is a tantalum capacitor, and the largest available is 47 microfarads. So two of those in parallel will give you 100 microfarads. The time delay of the 100 microfarads needs a charging resistor of about 3 mega ohms. Going for the most simple version of the circuit, which has an equal on and off time, makes this circuit like this. You've got pins 6 and 2 connected together. You've got the timing um, resistors above it. You've got the timing capacitor below it. The 10 nanofarad between pin 5 and the earth is a standard uh, stability component for the 555. Pins 4 and 8 are connected to the positive line and your output then is on pin 3. To get a little control over the time period the resistor is made from three 1, one meg resistors and a 1 meg variable resistor. The result is a circuit which is on for about 5 minutes and off for about 5 minutes. That is, the output on pin 3 goes high for 4 minutes, then low for 4 minutes. Um, and the low is about 0 volts, and the high is usually about 2 volts below the supply voltage. The supply voltage must never exceed 15 volts. Uh, the 55 ch chip is instantly destroyed by an overvoltage power supply. And yes, it's rated at 18 volts, um, but keep the voltage down to at least 15 volts. The second stage of the circuit is this. The voltage on pin 3 is fed through a capacitor to a transistor. And what happens is, when the voltage goes down, the capacitor pushes the voltage on the base of the transistor down low, which switches off the transistor and produces a high voltage on the output from the collector. The high value resistors here, 150 kilo ohms, charge up the capacitor progressively and after a few seconds the voltage on the capacitor here rises to allow the transistors to switch on again and the voltage drops low. So when the drive to the circuit goes down suddenly low, the circuit has an output that goes high for a few seconds then drops back down again. That's a simplified version of using a transistor to get a monostable circuit. The transistor is a high gain type and the cost of running it like this is only about one milliamp. The third stage of this is to take the output from this transistor here and feed it into a much more powerful resistor and co transistor combination. The transistor shown here is a TIP132, which is robust, cheap and very high power and it's protected by a 10k resistor. The 13 transistor, 132 transistor is very powerful indeed. It has a gain of at least a thousand. So the relay is then fed with anything up to 500 milliamps. Of course the relay doesn't draw anything remotely like that amount of current, but it does get the full battery voltage across it. The diode is just to protect the transistor from reverse voltage when the transistor switches off. The whole circuit then is you have a 10 minute delay and then the circuit switches the transistor off here and this transistor on for a few seconds and that triggers the relay which gives a switched output as desired. 
Not everybody re realizes this, but you can get a sine wave output, a reasonable quality sine wave output, directly from a 555 timer. Pin 3 gives you square wave, but if you connect two capacitors across the output and take your output f sine wave output from their, their join, where they meet together, you then get quite a reasonable sine wave. So far, we have been using transistors to switch on and off fully. It's not necessary to do that. A transistor circuit shown so far are known by the technical term of common emitter, because the emitters are generally connected to the negative rail or the battery minus line. This method of use is very popular because when the transistor is switched on, all of the supply voltage is supplied to the load. Another common and very useful method, though, is known as the emitter follower circuit, where the load is connected to the negative rail instead of the emitter, and with this arrangement, the voltage at the emitter remains at about 0.7 volts below the voltage of the transistor base, and it follows that voltage no matter how the voltage on the base changes. Generally speaking, the transistor is being used to amplify the current which could be drawn from the point in the circuit where the transistor base is connected. It's arranged like this. You have a low current supply voltage point and the that feeds the base of the transistor and 0.7 volts below that is applied to the load. It's very effective but you can use it in a number of ways. If the battery is generally 12 volts, then the slider of the resistor can be moved from 0 volts to plus 12 volts, or anything in between. But um, the voltage on the base of the transistor can be any of those values. If the voltage on the transistor base is 0 0.7 or higher, then the transistor will conduct current and the voltage across the load will increase until the emitter is 0.7 volts below the base voltage. This means that the voltage across the load can be adjusted to any valt value from 0 volts to 11.3 volts. This is known as an emitter follower circuit. But it also allows you to create a constant current circuit very simple constant current circuit. If we use two diodes, um, each of which will have about 0.7 volts voltage drop across it, and feed a current through a resistor, small current, through to there, then the voltage on point A will be about 1.4 volts, which means the voltage on the emitter of the transistor will be about 0.7 volts. If we then choose the value of resistor R2 to give the current that we want to flow through the transistor, and you can use Ohm's law to work out what that um, resistor should be, and pay attention to the wattage of the resistor if you want a large current, you can then put the load that you want to drive above the collector, between the collector and the positive line because the current flowing through the transistor is controlled by the voltage between the base and the emitter and the value of resistor R2. So if you opt to put 50 milliamps going through your transistor, that 50 milliamps has to flow through your load, assuming, of course, that your power supply can supply the current. That's a very neat way of creating a constant current, very simple, very direct and uses very few components as such. All right, moving on. If we want to find out the characteristics of a transistor, a diode, or an integrated circuit, we can go to the alldatasheet.com website. Uh, although Googling the transistor name often gets the needed information very quickly. Anyway, on the website, the top of the page has an entry section like this. As you put in the value of whatever you're interested in in there and hit the search button, then 
it will come up with uh, one or more entries in its display. If you click on the link, it will offer you a data sheet in PDF form. And if you click on that, it will then feed you a PDF file which gives you the details of whatever it is you are looking for. It will give you the appearance, the pin connections, the voltage rating, the current rating, the speed of switching and so on. It's very useful uh, indeed to be able to get something like that. Moving on again we come to alternating current. Uh, a battery gives a constant voltage. It's called <coughs> pardon me, it's called a direct current or a DC source of power. When it's connected to a battery, a circuit always has a positive rail and a negative rail. If you ca connect the battery to a circuit through a double pole changeover switch, as shown here, when the changeover switch is operated, the ba battery is effectively turned over or inverted. This circuit is called an inverter because it repeatedly inverts the supply voltage. If the switch is operated on a reg regular and rapid basis, the graph of the output voltage is like this, with square volts, square wave, as such. On the mains, it's more convenient for them to provide a waveform which is alternating, but which is a sine wave. Um, that is because it tends to come through a coil. But be aware that the voltage that this is described as is the average power voltage, called the root mean square. But the peak voltage is 1.4 times higher than that. That's the square root of 2 times higher. So you need to add 41% extra voltage onto the rated voltage of the power supply or main supply if you're going to try connecting something across it. Coils or solenoids are very useful things. They're very simple. If you take a cardboard tube and wrap a piece of wire around it, it produces a coil. Um, the coil has got a number of characteristics which we won't dwell on just at the moment because this is taking a long time to produce. But we can use them very readily. If we wind a coil with two strands of wire and connect them together in what's called a bifiler coil, you can produce a very simple uh, dual thief circuit. I've used a dual thief to charge a battery which started out at 0.55 volts up to 1.34 volts in one hour using an identical battery to drive the circuit. That identical battery started out with a voltage of 1.3 volt, 4 volts and finished up with a voltage of 1.29 volts which still is considered to be fully charged. You can download this tutorial if you want and there is a fuller version of the tutorial which is a good deal longer at that location there. Electronics is a large subject this presentation is only a very brief introduction to some of the basics. However, if you search on the internet, you'll find a great deal of additional information.